pretty much everyone who has done something very, very important in C++ is, is here at least every other year or so. Directly interfacing with those people is just an incredible boon to your career, especially early in your career. Getting to pick people's brains on things, um, just hanging out, talking with people, you can't put a price on that. And you don't get those online. Hello, everyone. Welcome to using Clang Libase T matchers for compliance and code bases. My name is Jonah Jolly. I'm a staff engineer at Devitry, a part of Dept. It's a Denver based company that does custom software. Um, and there, our goal is to help simplify the complex world of technology for our clients. Um, today, we're going to be talking about compliance. What is compliance? Um, the consequences of failing compliance, and how a company can stay compliant. With that information, um, we're going to kind of look into the problem that we saw and solved, and we're going to explore that, and then we'll go talk about claying tooling um, and how you can utilize that for this problem space. So what is compliance? Compliance generally is to adhere to laws and regulations set forth by a governing body or some sort of authority. Um, in the professional world, there's generally two buckets that this falls into. There's regulatory compliance, um, where, where a company within a industry has to follow those, the laws and regulations set forth. Um, or, and, and usually this is a government entity, but it can also be an association where they have some sort of special certification. The other side um, is organizational or corporate compliance. Uh, generally, I think of this as your human resources, your security departments, IT departments, and they, their policies are around keeping the workers safe, um, keeping intellectual property safe, as well as um, the liability of a, of a corporation. So generally when, when we fail compliance, the, the main thing that we're worried about, especially in a regulated um, industry where we're dealing with maybe the public welfare and health of people is that safety can be jeopardized. Um, following that, you know, quality can suffer. Um, if in, in terms of a, an industry that has, the standard to use a certain grade of material. If we use you know, a lower grade, then we could see that the um, shelf life or the quality of that product degrades. Um, on the other side of this is in coding practices and maybe QA processes. When, if a deadline is coming up, um, we're getting a feature in and you see uh, that a corner was cut, um, <clears throat> We can see that a bug gets released to the wild, and that is not good. The other thing after this is that trust is, is eroded. So I think we all have an example in mind where whether a, a news um, article came out or just your personal experience with a type of product, um, you think of that, uh, of that company and you, and you won't, get, won't buy, their, buy their stuff. And finally, depending on the industry, um, we can see that we'll get fines and disciplinary, disciplinary action. So when, we when a company finds themselves in noncompliance, um, in this particular example, uh, a medical device company, uh, the FDA has, you go through a process called a CAPA, which is corrective action and preventative action. And usually we start with an investigation of what the issue was, kind of understand um, what happened, whether it was a defect in the product or in process or um, you know, a user manual isn't up to date and it causes misuse of a device. From there, we um, work on a corrective action. So we'll, 
in some industries, this could be called, this is generally a recall. Um, and, and once we take a corrective action and understand the timeline, whether it's immediate or not, uh, we continue along this process with a root cause analysis where we really understand what happened with the process and how it came to be and where we can um, change processes to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So uh, I'm not a compliance officer, but generally the ways that we comply is it starts with education of, your, of the employees, ensuring that they know all the relevant workplace um, processes as well as in a in regulated industry, the um, rules and regulations that they need to follow. Um, the other one is documentation. So whether this is documenting the processes of a, of a workplace process or the, de the design and architecture documents of a product, um, these all are way ways to ensure compliance. In some fields, you have to submit all this documentation to be certified before a device can be released. And so to, <coughs> to ensure that we stay compliant where we have to do recurring reviews of said documentation or of the education and um, education portion to ensure we're up to date. And this is a, a generally a pretty manual process, um, but the thing about compliance um, and certain parts of being compliant is that it's a pretty well, um, well known problem space in that it's regulated rules um, and laws and, and the requirements are well defined. Um, and so the other way that we can comply um, <coughs> is automation. And so if you think about HIPAA or other, other laws, you, the requirement is that you know, no personal information can be released. And that can be something that we can easily check for especially in this day and age where there's a lot of infrastructure tools, um, everything has some sort of build process. Um, these can all be something that we could codify and understand. So why is this relevant? Or how is this relevant to, to me um, <clears throat> and my team? So my colleagues and I, we were working in a um, industry where um, we had um, to submit the documentation of this device to a governing body, uh, and we're working in a critical space where failure to ensure we mitigate all of these um, situations that could occur could end in uh, user, user harm. And so what happened to us was that the code base didn't accurately reflect what was documented, and after review, it could, we saw that you know, a potential unmitigated unsafe condition could occur. Um, and this is specific to what happened to us, but if we think about this um, in a general sense, there's a lot of different, um, like in terms of HIPAA or things like that, personal user data, uh, there's, there's ways that this could bite others. So, Instead of talking about a medical device so that we can further explore um, the situation around <laughs> um, the problem that we solved, we're gonna be working with um, Spooky Factory, who was a consumer Halloween um, candy company. And they've been developing a all-in-one consumer candy making device that you can buy and take home. And so as we see here, we have an LED uh, screen. Um, there you could pick whatever candy you want. Right now it's on screensaver. And then we have a pumpkin LED here and it, and it lights uh, um, different statuses with what the device is doing. And then, and then we have this uh, chamber door that we can open and after the candy creation process is, is all said and done, we can open it and grab the candy. Um, and I think they ran out of time. 
and trick was not implemented. And so a little bit farther down into the device, as we see, we have this, this kind of GUI process. It handles the commands to the baker. Um, and so you can pick the different, a different candy that you want, and then it sends the command to the baker. Um, we have a driver process, and that holds all the uh, microcontroller code and sensor uh, information, and it provides an API to the baker process to be able to uh, interact and drive the components. The baker process takes a recipe that we select, and it creates um, the candy that we want. Um, and then inside the baker process, there's monitors, and based on the recipe that's running, we have a monitor. We have monitors that will listen to the sensors or look at the sensors and will raise an alarm if there's an unsafe condition. There's this alarm manager that we have, um, and the alarm manager will read these alarms. As it will see that alarm has been risen, and it will go and look into a config file to understand what are the next steps, um, whether we need to shut the device down or we need to um, override and adjust one of the components. So our problem is that, or so we have that alarms will describe an unsafe condition and we have monitors that ensure the device's conditions stay nominal and we have an alarm man manager, alarm manager that will enforce corrective action. Um, what we want with this is that because we will have to submit those alarms to be um, audited to say that we've covered every single situ situation that could occur, we need to ensure that the code base and documentation stay consistent. To do that, we need to ensure that every alarm defined in the config is used somewhere in the code base and eventually that every alarm is raised. Um, so how do we solve this? So up here we have a a very compressed monitor. It takes an alarm client, um, which is instantiated with a string, whether a literal or from a config file, and then eventually it will be raised. We um, and so generally, what we used to do is there's a manual process for this. It takes a lot of hours, person hours, to maintain. It's error prone. That's why we ended in, up in the situation to begin with. And the existing tools to um, keep track of this are cumbersome, you know, whether it's a spreadsheet that everyone's working off of, or I'm sure the management systems that are still in place for this that people have used, um, you can have all your gripes about that. The other idea that maybe, maybe um, came up is we could use regexes. It's, it's just text files after all. Um, we could use a simple regex like this, and we could grab it. That seems pretty easy, but what if, you know, instead of just a simple, we call it and then we, we raise it um, in the same file. Um, this is all in one file for brevity, but we can imagine that, it, that the private declaration is in a header file, and then now we have to look at two, like the header and the CPP file and ensure that we are correctly accounting for that. Um, and then also we can see that, you know, it, now we're doing a make unique. Um, so the complexity blows up and now we have two monitor or two alarms where now they're grabbing from config files and now we have to go figure out what the config is. And so we find that the idea of using regexes for this would be brittle. Um, and the, while the underlying, um, the underlying representation of the C++ code would be similar um, from the text side, well, from what you would see just from a text file, it'd be very different, complex to maintain. Um, every time you make a really cool regex and then come back to it after an extended period of time, you have no idea what it does. Um, and then you'd have low confidence that it would be, you were actually con actually grabbing every case. And as, as you create more and more of these monitors and alarms and instantiations, how do you know that you're doing that well? And then 
it's diff difficult to capture all that information. And so if we think to an example where we could have two functions in a class um, and they both have a local variable and the, the variables named the same, um, you could each call it alarm client. Now you need to, how do you reconcile that you have all the context and know that the, the rays that you've, that you're raising is actually the instantiation that you've looked at. So that leads us to claim tooling. <clears throat> um, existing tools that you may know of, claim tidy, it's really awesome. Um, this could be a idea to use, but the thing with claim tidy is, you know, we could, we could write a custom checker, but we'd still be, um, adhering to the output of what Clang Tidy would do. Uh, we we kind of need a little bit more control than that. Um, so come <coughs> lib tooling, uh, it's what Clang Tidy relies on. And with lib tooling, we can create our own standalone. And from there, we can create our own outputs. We can create um, the own, we can specialize it to what we need so we can really only look for the bits that we need. <clears throat> and uh, with this, uh, code bases are often very, like have a lot of different um, file types in them. It's not, it, sometimes, it's usually not just C++. And so <clears throat> being able to utilize this and control the output of the program, we'd be able to, um, you know, just have other tools post-process and create a pipeline um, to ensure that we are correctly uh, bookkeeping the alarms. So what is Clang Lib Tooling? It, it's the library to support writing standalone tools. Um, it, we can run it over single files or subset of files. Um, this is really cool because in this sort of pipeline, it makes it really parallel, par parallelizable. Um, and it gives us full control and access of the Clang AST. Um, <clears throat> this is, will be important later. And then also, because we're um, using the same code as uh, the Clang ecosystem, we can share code with plugins. So the Clang AST, uh, if you're uh, Manual Clinic does a really good overview of the AST and um, everything that's involved with it. Uh, this will just be a brief overview um, so that we can have some common vocabulary that we can talk, we can reason with. Um, this is part of the front end process. Uh, it provides us two, uh, it provides us AST context, which is like the source manager and identifier table. And so when we're matching and searching through these um, through the AST, we can actually go back and look where it is in source. Uh, it's comprised of, I mean, there's three core classes that we really care about. Um, there's um, that a lot of the matchers will be using. There's declarations or decal, and this is like a variable declaration or a function declaration. Um, statements, so if statements or you know, switch statements, and then types. And so it, for an example, if we look at this uh, program, it doesn't do anything, it's not very interesting, but what it will highlight is that we see on line four, we declare int i equals 12, and then we have an if statement on line six. And so when we look at the AST, we can see um, at the very top, there's the function declaration of main int. We see this variable declaration, and then we see the if statement. Um, <clears throat> and a couple things, when we're looking at it in this um, view, we can see that it's in a tree structure. Uh, so if statement, and then the vocabulary that we use is descendant and ancestor, and so if we see in if statement, it has a descendant of a binary operator, and so we can see how this gets constructed. Similarly, we have this variable declaration with a descendant of, um, of an integer literal, and then everything has an ancestor of this function declaration. 
Okay, so the, the main ways to interact with the AST is recursive visitor, um, and that's utilized heavily by refactoring tools, um, and you can, it's based on, you can match on a type, um, but it doesn't give you the full amount of context that we would want when we're looking through the code. So the other um, way to interact with the Clang AST and, and kind of grab and navigate it is AST matchers. Um, they, they will reuse predicates to like search through them and it's really cool because then you can compose those. So the libAST matcher, it's a DSL um, to be able to interact and, and search through the AST. It, uh, it uses a match callback to access that predicate that you'd write. So for instance, we could write, I wanna write a, a variable declaration matcher that sets an integer literal. And so then we'd have a callback and we would call back and we'd have that node of the, the variable declaration of int i. Um, to be able to do that, there's three basic categories of matchers. There's the node matchers, and this is kind of the main one that we're talking about. So like, uh, it gets the main node, the top level node. <clears throat> and for instance, that would be a variable declaration, var decal. This is the only matcher that you can bind on. So um, when we want to access it from a callback, we would call, we do like variable declaration dot or var decal dot bind and then a string that we can later call back from. Once we get a, a node match, there's narrowing matchers. And so if we'll see in a moment, if you were to just do a match on variable declarations, you, you pull in a lot more um, context than just the, the file. And so we need narrowing matchers. And narrowing matchers are things like has type um, or, uh, uh, so you could say, I want to a variable decoration that is that has a type of int. And then finally, the traversal matchers. So when these, these, uh, these different um, classes, the declaration, the decal, the statement, and everything that inherits them, they don't have a, they're not on, all based off of a common base class, so they don't have common um, ways to traverse. So what, to, to be able to go move around the AST, we need to use traversal matchers. Um, so for instance, if we were thinking about the variable declaration of int i, if we wanted to grab that integer literal, we would say, um, uh, we'd say variable declaration, and then we'd say it has a descendant of, of an int, and then we could bind on that in, in, integer literal. So let's write a match together. If we look back at that, um, the monitor that we're, the sugar monitor that we were first thinking about, can, is that, that one doesn't have highlighting, oh no. Um, so the first step would be to dump the AST. Um, and you'll see the, how much of a dump it is. Like this is 57,000 lines for a eight line class. <laughs> um, but as we see here, uh, at the top, uh, we see this method declaration of void. Um, we see this variable declaration of an alarm client, and it's of type spooky factory alarm client. And then we see there's like all of this stuff, which is like, I think to, we're casting a char, the string literal into and allocating a string, um, but then we have the string literal and sugar too hot. And so with that, with that information, we can st start figuring out how to um, grab that and mark that off as we have this in the config file and look, we instantiate it in the code base. 
uh, farther down, and, and at the very end we see we have this member call expression um, where we actually call the raise, and it has a type um, alarm client. <clears throat> so the next step is, so now that we know that we want a variable declaration, we can boot up claim query. Um, this is a really cool tool that we have access to where we can use these matchers as they're written in C++ and explore a file with them. Um, and then we can just copy, once we figure out the matching that we want, we can just copy paste it into a, into a C++ file and then use that. So when, remember when I was saying how there's a lot of var decals out there? Um, so in that, this file, again, it matches um, 5,800 times. What's interesting though um, is that you can see that we have this bind root here that generally just creates noise, so we can, we can turn that off. And so now let's make a more interesting um, matcher. So we go match, or you can just do M, and we know the node, and then we can do a narrowing matcher of has, has type. It's also cool, I mean, you can, it, the autocomplete sort of works. The more predicates you add, the harder, like, it doesn't really work that well. So you can say has type, and then we know that it's a spooky factory alarm client, so we say has type as string spooky factory alarm client. And then we'll bind it to inst. And look at that. So now we can, now we're grabbing that node. Um, <clears throat> The next bit of information that we'd want out of this, uh, when we will finally add it to our standalone tool, is that n now that we know that we can find this case of alarm client instantiation, we need to also know um, what it was instantiated with. And to grab that, we can use a traversal and say has descendant. And then we say string literal. Because, yeah, and then we can say bind stringlet, <clears throat> and so now we're getting two we're getting two binds on this matcher, which we can later pull pull from the um, code. So when we're thinking about in the case that we could have multiple alarms. Um, it, like local variable instantiated in a in a um, in a file, what we'd want to be able to do is know you know like the fully qualified local variable name. So we'd want it to say like sugar too hot monitor colon colon the the function that it was called from, and then the the rest of this information, and that will help us accurately track. Um, if we're actually instantiating alarm or not. And the la that last bit um, is from the, uh, the, it's the ancestor of this, which is the, the method declaration, this, the C++ or CXX method de declaration. And for that, we'd go, we'd go up, and we could say has ancestor, um, CXX method decal, and then we could bind that to method. So now we have all the information that we'd need to qualify a local variable in a monitor and with, with um, confidence say that yes, we've instantiated it. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm just focusing on the instantiation um, for, the, uh, for raising it. Uh, it'd be a similar kind of process. And so now that we have uh, all three of these binds that we need, we can see here, uh, down here, the variable declaration has type as string. Um, and now we can create a matcher for that. 
And what that matcher looks like is um, hopefully this looks fine. We got that code. So this is just kind of boilerplate setting up a a a standalone tool. We get all these things from Clang that we need, um, and then I have the the way that we decided to emit events is through JSON. Um, this is just quick, so we can say like uh, alarm client instantiated, and then we can say you know instantiated with a type string literal and the value. But if we look at this um, declaration matcher, we can see this is basically the exact same. This is the exact same thing that we had in Clang Query, which is we, we have a variable declaration of a type, has ancestor and has descendant. One thing to note is that every, um, you can have as many uh, predicates inside of this as you want, and it kind of acts as an all of. So all of these have to match correctly for you to get this back. Um, and then we can, you can pull out the different you can pull out the different nodes and get a pointer to them and then be able to extract the relevant information. And so what, uh, and so then if we were to run this, oh, oh, we don't want to run it in GDB. But you could run it in GDB and you could break on the matcher and kind of stop and then explore around what's going on. So we run this and we see, you know, grab it. And then we see right here that it actually grabbed that information, the run client, alarm client, and it was instantiated with type string literal, which is pretty cool. So the other, the other example that um, I would want to kind of go over quickly is that if we have a, it's a similar, it's a similar thing with the sugar too hot, but now it's from a config. And so now this kind of complicates things because now instead of a string literal that we're binding on, now we're binding on a, some sort of config file, whatever that might be. For us, uh, it kind of looks like this. Um, where we it's a we pull from a config file that is kind of an underlying struct, and then we have another like section, and so this maps to like JSON um, or XML, where you can just say like config file dot variable name dot alarm name, and then in runtime, what this would do is would go and pull that, because we don't have that runtime information, we have to instead figure out where it came from. So we have this, we, at least we have a guarantee that the, the alarm or the XML name would be sugar to hot monitor dot XML. And then, so all we need to do is ne we need to figure out what the config file class name is and then the dot, the dot mapping and then we could pull that. Um, and so the, Interesting, so we can start the same kind of process, and it's really, for, for this, it's just kind of showing that the, the Clang documentation can sometimes be a little scary, um, but with kind of these basic building blocks, it, it is pretty approachable once you kind of understand how to move around in it. Um, and here we see again, it's a variable declaration, so we know that we can start with variable decal of t has type, but instead of a <clears throat> instead of a string literal that it's instantiated with, we see that it is instead this member expression, and we actually see that there's three member expressions as it continues to to go down um, the the stack. The, so we can go back into the clean query. And 
from config. And so now uh, what we see is like if we were to use, um, oh, I guess it doesn't, doesn't always remember. If we were used to use that decal type, String. We see that we can get this alarm name. Um, what we what is interesting is is so in, we'll we can do something where um, in Clean Query we can actually uh, define matchers, and so what we could do. Um, for, for time is we can say, uh, we can say let, we can say config, se config section, and we see that we have a member expression and it has an object, and so this is, has an object expression and has type of a C++ record declaration, and it is a config, config file section, and then we'll bind it to the config section. Um, these, these are kind of things that you get by entering into the node um, and kind of exploring the documentation. So we can bring this back up and we can do has descendant. And then we can say config section. Um, and we can see here that we can grab that. Um, what's interesting is that uh, so we could take this and we could put it into the, into a standalone, into the standalone binary and run it. But now, and so now we have a matcher that will only match configs or will only match a string literal. We can join those together. And so if we were to, so we have another monitor, um, that's called sugar both, and we can see we have this case where we have a um, one function that runs an alarm client from a config file, and then we, we have another one that runs it from the string literal, and we need to ensure that these all work correctly. We can go into here, and let's say we have that We'll grab that um, section. Um, because uh, we can compose these, we can do something like var decal, um, and then we have a narrowing matcher of spooky alarm, spooky factory alarm client. One, two, one, two three. Okay, so we see we can match on both of them, but we want to know we when we get when we would when we would get that back from in the matcher that wouldn't be very helpful. So um, uh, and what we can do is we can create a composable. We can have config section. Um, so we have it can either be a config file, or we can do here, and we can say any of. So we need we have to match at least one of these. A descendant of string literal. Um, or a or has descendant of that. And this is where auto autocomplete stops working. <laughs> of config section. No, we or we messed it up. It's either auto config stops working or you didn't do it correctly. Um, uh, 
So we say any of one, one descendant string literal bind. I think we need it on the bind. Does not support binding. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> Just got to keep guessing with your prints until it works. <laughs> <clears throat> so here we go. Now we can we grab both of the instantiations and we grab what they were instantiated with. Um, so if we if we wanted to run that. We would say match. I think it was both. So we'll take a little bit. Um, we can compile it. Uh, when you build LLVM um, and you don't really specify anything, you just kind of get it working, it will be debug. And so this. I think this like matcher will be something like 300 or 400 megs. So when you want to build it for production, definitely remember to use release flags, and then it'll be somewhere around like 30 megabytes. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just a heads up. Okay, now it works. And then we can do a spooky matcher. Okay, so look, it it still works on the regular. The regular one, as we see, um, let's get that stuff out of there. It still works on the regular one, and then it, it works on the from config one, but we know that, so let's just see it work on both. And there we go. <clears throat> we can see alarm instantiated. We get the sugar too hot, sugar too hot monitor both from run alarm client, and then the from second, the second function alarm client. And then we can see uh, with the type, you can see config the class name spooky monitor API, and then we can, from the XML path, we can go from there. Um, so. Wrapping up this tool, um, it's it's pretty cool because when you th think it, oh, question? There's, there's a question online. Yeah. How do you ensure that matched code is actually executed in some scenarios instead of just being used in some dead code as meant for the compliance requirements? Uh, you can't. Um, hopefully, uh, with the, from, from the Clang tooling, or from this specific matcher, um, I don't think you can. If it picks it up and sees it, then we'll match to it. The, hopefully, the, your compiler will be airing that there is dead code there, um, or the other side would be just that through review process um, that would be caught. Um, <clears throat> for So with this tool, um, it's we can have this as just part of the pipeline of kind of figuring out and understanding um, what what alarms are being instantiated with. Uh, this this method doesn't work for everything. Um, some cases are too complicated. For instance, uh, if there's something that is only known at runtime and like there's no static um, there's no like static uh, record of it. Uh, the thing that we, I can think of is that if, for instance, there's like you, a, a map of alarm clients or alarm names, and then you're iterating through that, and then there's some way to that you call from there, um, or things that where you have some kind of magic factory and these an alarm client is kind of created out of at runtime and you have no way of really reconciling um, where it came from um, or what it's being used for. And so because of this, uh, 
we had to have an override mechanism. Um, we just had to, had to go and code and say, yes, I see that this is being called. I see that this is correct. And you can just spoof those little messages, um, which was kind of a, a plus for having it, having it as a pipeline of we're going to emit all of these JSON messages and then we can later post process them. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah. Let's see. So we have a little bit more time, so I can go through another, um, another example um, real quick. We've, we've, seen, we've seen just the alarm client instantiation by itself, but a, a little more complicated um, example is the, is the unique pointer um, example. So we have a thermometer thermometer mismatch monitor. Um, and here we see that we have a unique pointer uh, declaration for alarm client. And then in the run, we eventually will instantiate um, a unique pointer with thermometer mismatch, and then we raise it. So same kind of thing. Where do we start? We dump the AST. A little bit more, maybe, we don't know. Um, and so in here, uh, there's a little bit more going on, but the important thing that we see, or that we can, we can latch on to, is that we see this um, member expression. Oh. You see this member expression right here. Um, and then we have a call expression, and, and then we see the string literal. So it looks like this node is kind of where we want to be. Um, so we can start with that. We can go, we can get into clean query. I mean, say, you can say match member expression. Um, we'll just start with this. Oh, there's a lot going on. And so we see here we have a member expression um, of alarm client. And, and then we can do um, has send in. Um, do we have to do a oh, shoot match? Okay, so in the first one in the member expression, we only grabbed the alarm client. Uh, what we care about is the full um, line that's happening. And so to grab that, we need to have the full uh, expression. The next part that we would wanna look at um, is how can we ensure that what we're actually grabbing is of something that we care about. Um, for this, uh, we can do Something like um, okay. We're just gonna that won't work. So we can see that, okay. 
Oh, shoot. So we have the CXX operator. And we know that when we first matched it, we saw with a member expression, we saw that we grabbed that alarm client. So what we can do is we can go search for that member expression. Um, as string. And unfortunately, we have to say the whole thing um, in this case. Is that white space sensitive? Yes. Uh, well, not in between the different um, the like, calls. If I had white space in, in between my angles, would that, would that fail the match? No. Okay. This type stood unique pointer. I'm missing something. Oh, yes. There we go. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but here we, we caught two things. So both of these are technically um, uh, CXX operated call expressions, and they both have a descendant of the member expression of this alarm client. Um, so what we'd, we'd need to further narrow this more. Um, and how we would do that is we could say, uh, well, we're doing, an, we're doing an equal has overloaded operating name. And we can put, we are using an equal sign. And so we get rid of that other call to the object. And then finally, what we could do um, inside the member expression is we could add one, two, three, one, two, three. Well, it's, we're not going to do it. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> what we could do is we could count into there inside that member expression. And inside that member expression, we could say has descendant. And then we could either do that, the full predicate of the config files and the um, string literal. Um, and then we'd be able to match everything that we'd need to then um, go ahead and with confidence say that we have actually instantiated and are using this alarm. So um, with that, I hope that this has at least sparked um, some ideas where there's a problem space in your code base that this could address. Um, you know, one of the examples that I thought of while working on this is that, and I think I may have mentioned it before, but like HIPAA compliance, if in your code you have login statements, you could write a matcher for every time the login statements are called and look inside those, look inside what it's called with, and then with your domain knowledge of your code, understand if that's uh, protected data or not. Um, so yeah, any questions? Yeah. Um, so is this as simple as it gets, or can you do like a simpler, without having to know all this stuff later, if you know more about the tool? Um, is this as simple as it gets? Uh, so like this is like in terms of, this is the learning curve to get to before you can utilize it. Uh, I think this is about as simple as it gets um, to be able to utilize it. I think there is a learning curve in terms of understanding the different, um, all the different expressions and, and APIs available to you. I think that's kind of one of the biggest um, blockers, I think, for not seeing more widespread use and just like random use of this tool. And hopefully this kind of helped show that there's, there's ways to explore it and you can self-explore and, and kind of understand what's happening with the code. Cool. There's a question online. Yeah. Could you use these kinds of tools to generate tests automatically? Um, I don't see why not. <laughs> if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, I think that's a, would be a really interesting use case of these. Um, excited to see it. 
There's a question online. Do you run these kinds of checks in a CI system? Yes. So this, this tool is run on every single build um, and can gate the build. So we, you can say in a, the actual, in the actual code base that this lives, um, the full version, uh, it will go through and it will call out, you know, it'll say these, this was found in, in this config file, but it's nowhere in the code base. Uh, this is something to gate the build on and we'll fill the build for that because as per the compliance that we follow, that would be us out of compliance and we would get fined. Yep. Can you pull up the source code for your C++ file that you actually were putting these queries in through? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Um, no, no. So for, yeah, and this is the simple case, but really it doesn't matter, um, simple case or not, because once you have that boilerplate, how you continue to add to the program as you see more cases is we have this declaration statement or this declaration matcher. So you create this matcher that we created in Clank Query. You create a handler for that matcher where once you're in there, you can use all that context. Um, and, and then down in the main function, you um, link, you add that to the finder, and then the tool will take it and run with it. And so this is the same amount of boilerplate as uh, a production or a production tool. Obviously, probably could be optimized more, but it, you know, the speed, it works well enough for us. Um, and then as we find more things that we want to check, we continue to add just to the, to the main file, like right here. How performant do you find this is? Um, like the compiled binary? Yeah. Uh, I, so um, the question was how performant do you think the, the, or how performant is this compiled binary? It can process, um, it can do one file in a real, in a real code base every about like two to three seconds depending. Um, and, but the thing is, is that it's, it doesn't depend on anything. So we can basically, you know, thread this out and run, you know, 50 or more at a time. Um, it really depends on how much, how integrated and how coupled the file that you're checking is because it has to build out every single, the entire, um, the entire AST for everything that's, that's included. Yep. More of a comment to the question that uh, if you want to increase performance, there are narrowing matches. Uh, it can basically look at if the node is expanded in the current file. And so it just regards all the files from taken and sending SPS files. Mm. That, I think, increases performance in that. Okay. Can you say that one more time? I think just for online. Uh, I was saying in case of performance, okay. you can narrow down the processing of the nodes in your AST by using matches, uh, narrowing matches such as uh, is expansion in main file, you mm. kind of narrow down your AST search to the nodes. Right, yes. Time. Yeah, um, the comment was in to to narrow down how much work your matches are doing, you can add a narrowing matcher that's called like is expansion in main file. And so it won't go out and look um, outside of the main file or direct, direct includes. Cool. Well, thank you.